Hello and welcome to the Film Jerk Podcast. I am your host, Edward Havens. Today we conclude our journey through the 1980s cinematic universe of Martin Scorsese with one of his most acclaimed movies, one that has a complicated history, a complicated lead character, and one that I have a complicated relationship with, Raging Bull. The Bronx Bull, the Raging Bull. Let's hear for the great Jake LaMotta, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the best. And I can take him more than anybody. You're dead, you're married. Leave the young girls for me. There's no way I'm going down. I don't go down for nobody. Listen with him. Why does he have to make it so hard on himself? If you beat Trigger Ray, you'll get a shot at the title. You feel that way? There's no one else around who wants to fight him. They're all afraid. There's a lot of bad things, Joey. Maybe it's coming back to me. Raging Bull, of course, began its life as a memoir. Raging Bull, My Story was written by former boxing star Jake LaMotta. The book, which was published in 1970, detailed LaMotta's life from his childhood through the end of his boxing career. He wrote about his time as a young teenage criminal, his time in reformatory school, his extensive career as an amateur and professional boxer, his struggles with those who would help him become a champion and would later help keep titles out of his reach, and his volatile obsession with his second wife, Vicky. The book would not become a bestseller. While he was a very successful boxer, going 83-19 and 19 during his 13-year boxing career, and his six-fight matchup with Sugar Ray Robinson was amongst the most famous rivalries in all of sports, it had been 16 years since LaMotta had last fought, and years since he was able to parlay his success in the ring into a slew of supporting acting roles in movies like Robert Rosen's The Hustler and William Martin's The Doctor and the Playgirl. LaMotta was, by 1970, an all-but-forgotten man. One person who would read LaMotta's book was a young up-and-coming actor named Robert De Niro, who read it while he was in Sicily making Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather Part Two. De Niro didn't think much of Jake LaMotta the writer, but he was blown away by the character of Jake LaMotta. After finishing filming on the role that would win him his first Oscar, De Niro would travel to Tucson, Arizona, where his friend Martin Scorsese was shooting Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, in the hopes of getting the director to make it into a movie with De Niro in the leading role. But Scorsese didn't want anything to do with it. He didn't like boxing. He thought it was boring. And he wasn't sure how he would be able to make it into a movie, and so on and so forth. But De Niro was not going to take Scorsese's no lightly. When the actor returned to New York City after visiting Scorsese, De Niro would go and visit Marduk Martin, Scorsese's friend from their days at NYU Film School and co-writer of Mean Streets. Martin would read the book, but he thought it was something that he had seen a hundred times before. He wasn't interested in it, unless somehow Marty could be persuaded. In the summer of 1977, United Artists was riding high. They had just won the Best Picture Oscar a few months earlier for Rocky and were desperate for another boxing movie, preferably Rocky II. De Niro, still carrying around his copy of Raging Bull, went to visit the producers of Rocky, Erwin Winkler and Robert Chartoff. The duo had just produced Scorsese's lavish musical New York, New York, and De Niro knew Raging Bull would be something that would help them and help himself. Winkler would read De Niro's copy of the book and expressed an interest in making the movie, as long as they could get Marty to direct. But Scorsese would not budge, until a few dominoes fell the wrong way for him. First, on June 21, 1977, New York, New York would open in theaters. Nobody expected it to be a big hit like Star Wars had become over the previous four weeks, but it would become Scorsese's first dud with the critics, and audiences stayed away. The director was depressed. He wanted to be an auteur, and he was not prepared for a failure of this size. The lithium and cocaine didn't help matters, nor did Scorsese's living in Los Angeles, where drugs were easy to get and one could get lost amongst all the hangers-on 
who wanted to be part of a famous person's circle. To fight his depression, Scorsese and his longtime friends like Robbie Robertson of the band and Marduk Martin would stay up all night watching movies in Scorsese's garage, which had been converted into a screening room, and doing drugs. Things were getting so bad that at one party at Erwin Winkler's house, John Cassavetes tried to intervene concerning Scorsese's drug use, warning him that he was screwing up his talent and that he needed to get his head back in the game. But Scorsese would not heed Cassavetes calling out. Another person who wouldn't give up on Scorsese was Robert De Niro, who knew there was only one filmmaker who could make Raging Bull. De Niro would get Winkler and Chartoff to hire Marduk Martin to write the first draft of the screenplay, while Scorsese worked on editing The Last Waltz, his documentary about the band's final concert on Thanksgiving Day, 1976. The film would premiere at the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood in late April 1978, and Scorsese would, by the end of the screening, feel that he no longer had the passion for directing he once had. As his de facto roommate at the Mulholland Drive house now, Marduk Martin would try to coax Scorsese into reading the screenplay. A hundred times, Martin would ask, and one hundred times, Scorsese would find an excuse not to. Martin would dive wholeheartedly into his work, even going to spend a few days with Vicky LaMotta at her house in Florida to get her side of some of the instances described in the book. Finally, one day, Scorsese would ask about the screenplay. Martin would tell him about one scene he was working on. The writer would compare the scene to the days of gladiator fights in ancient Rome, but instead of the crowd being far away in the stands, they'd be right there next to the ring. So when LaMotta would get smashed in the face and blood would start to gush out of the wound, the blood would splatter all over these very fancy people's very fancy clothes and very fancy furs. That description of that scene would get Scorsese's attention. He would read the script, and he started to look for ways to make it more personal to him. He would start dictating happenings from his own personal family history for Martin to find ways to add into the screenplay. And although he found many of the suggestions to not be worthy of the story he was working on, Martin would throw them in anyway, worried that De Niro would be angered by the changes. De Niro was very angered by the changes. But while he understood that the changes weren't necessarily Martin's fault, De Niro wanted to make a change. He would convince Scorsese and Winkler that it was time to bring in a new writer. Someone who had also worked with De Niro and Scorsese in the past, who had in the last few years segged from being a hot screenwriter to a hot screenwriter and director. Paul Schrader. De Niro only needed to convince Schrader. Schrader was also in Los Angeles at the time, directing a film he had written called Hardcore, starring George C. Scott, when De Niro showed up to talk. Principal photography only had one more week to go, and while Robert De Niro would always be a welcomed guest on any film shoot, Schrader knew De Niro well enough to know that the actor just doesn't stop by to chit-chat. Something was up. De Niro wanted something from Schrader. De Niro would waste little time getting to the point. United Artists was ready to greenlight Raging Bull, but not with the script as it currently stood, and no writer in the film industry knew how Scorsese and De Niro operated quite like Paul Schrader. Maybe the three of them, De Niro, Schrader, and Scorsese, could meet for dinner one night once shooting on Hardcore was complete and discuss Schrader doing a polish on the Raging Bull script. The three men would meet for dinner a few weeks later at the famed Musso and Frank's Grill on Hollywood Boulevard. If you've seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know the place. Schrader didn't particularly want to work on someone else's movie, but he didn't mind having dinner with some old friends, especially if they were picking up the tab. Schrader listened to De Niro's vision for the movie, since Scorsese was still indifferent to the project and had not fully agreed to make it yet. And by the end of the meal, was convinced to do a quick polish of the screenplay. Since Scorsese was letting Marduk Martin stay with him, it would be up to the director to tell the writer he was off the project. Schrader didn't want to have any conflicts with a fellow writer and regular Scorsese collaborator over the change. 
He would send someone over to the Mulholland house to collect all of Martin's research and various versions of the script he had written so far. And while he read Martin's research and various drafts, Schrader realized this was going to be more than just a polish. This was going to be a full-on rewrite. Schrader would add one major character from a modest story that was missing from all of Martin's drafts of the screenplay, Joey LaMotta, the younger brother of Jake who would become his older brother's manager and emotional punching bag. Writing the Jake Joey scenes into the screenplay were easy and cathartic for Schrader, who had his own complicated relationship with his own older brother, Leonard. Schrader's script came together quickly, but when the executives at United Artists saw the new draft, they got cold feet. This was a very different story from the one they originally read, much darker and brutal. They were ready to pass, but Erwin Winkler was still holding an ace in the hole. Rocky II. You want Rocky II, he asked. It's a package deal. You get both, or you get none. Rocky II would begin production a few months later. De Niro, Schrader, and Scorsese would fight over the new direction of the screenplay, with Schrader at one point literally throwing his copy of the script across the room towards De Niro and Scorsese, telling them that no one is going to give a damn about the movie if they don't care about the character. De Niro was waffling about some of the more raw scenes that showed LaMotta's vulnerability, and Scorsese would let De Niro and Schrader fight, since he still wasn't 100% convinced that this was a movie he wanted to make. Cut to Labor Day weekend, 1978. De Niro, Scorsese, his girlfriend Isabella Rossellini, and Marduk Martin had traveled to Colorado to attend that year's Telluride Film Festival. Scorsese's cocaine addiction was at its worst, and when he ran out of the stash he had brought with him from New York, he would buy some local blow that wasn't of very good quality. The weekend after returning to New York, Scorsese would have an episode that caused him to start bleeding. From his eyes, from his nose, from his mouth, even from his backside. He was rushed to the hospital. After doctors in the emergency room stabilized him, Rossellini had a plane to catch to Italy for some modeling work that she had already been contracted for. When she left the hospital, she was sure that that would be the last time she would see Scorsese alive. His prognosis was bad. His body was shutting down from all the various drugs, legally prescribed and otherwise, that were fighting for control. His doctors would cut off all medications, including his regularly needed asthma inhaler, and started to clean up his system so his body could fight back properly. The doctor would tell Scorsese straight up, he needed to make some serious changes in his life, starting right then and there, or he was going to be dead very soon. No more drinking, or illicit drugs, or cholesterol-rich foods, and no more hard partying. In his private room at New York Hospital, Scorsese had very little to do besides lay there and get better, so he watched a lot of movies on TV mostly old black-and-white movies that were playing on a local independent television station. One day, De Niro came to visit. He appealed to Scorsese to do the right thing, make himself healthy again so he could be with his family, so he could watch his young daughter, who had just turned two, grow up and get married, and so that they could work together many more times, starting with Raging Bull. Scorsese agreed to make the film. He finally understood Jake LaMotta. He finally understood how self-delusion and self-destruction and a total disregard of how one's inner demons could change a person and their relationship with their loved ones. He had found his way into the story. Once Scorsese was better and discharged from the hospital, he and De Niro would head out, just the two of them, to St. Martin's Island in the Caribbean to do one final polish of their own on the script to tone down some of the more controversial passages Schrader had added into the screenplay, such as a close-up of LaMotta's penis as he pours ice water all over it before a fight. When they returned to New York with their updated screenplay, United Artists gave them the go-ahead to make the movie. One idea Scorsese had very early on in pre-production process 
was that the film was to be filmed in black and white to not only evoke a sense of nostalgia for the time frame the movie takes place in, but to also make it stand out against the myriad of other boxing movies that were filming around the same time. Besides Rocky II, Warner Brothers had the main event, featuring Ryan O'Neill as a boxer and Barbara Streisand as his manager. The Champ, a boxing movie from UA sister studio MGM, featuring John Voight as a former boxing champion who goes back into the ring to help support his son and mend his relationship with his ex-wife. And American International Pictures' Matilda, about a boxing kangaroo. The movie was scheduled to shoot in two sections, beginning in April 1979. The bulk of the film would shoot first, when the young Jake LaMotta was becoming the champion, having marital issues and his decline into semi-obscurity. Then the production would take two months off while De Niro headed to Italy so he could gain the 50 or 60 pounds needed to play the older and not very wiser LaMotta 15 years later. The first section of production was very slow going. Even a brilliant cinematographer like Michael Chapman, who had shot Taxi Driver for Scorsese, as well as Hardcore for Paul Schrader, The Last Detail for Hal Ashby, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers and the Wanderers for Philip Kaufman, was having some trouble lighting the boxing scenes. Thinking in black and white is a far different discipline for a DP than thinking in color. And Scorsese, who was certain that this was going to be his last movie and wanted to go for broke on everything, was having trouble staying patient. While Chapman lit the scene, Scorsese would be in his trailer, cranking up his favorite band, The Clash, to full volume, pacing around getting amped up by the music, and help and help them all if the album was completed before Chapman was ready to film. But Chapman was working to achieve what Scorsese asked for, to have a single camera in the ring for the boxing sequences without any additional coverage, as if the lens were the eyes of Lomata, his opponents, or the referee, depending on the moment. The boxing scenes would be the first to shoot in Los Angeles, and De Niro would spend weeks training with Jake Lamata himself to get the feel of a professional boxer right. It has been estimated that De Niro sparred with Lamata for nearly a thousand rounds in the months before filming began, and by the time they were done, Lamata felt that the then 35-year-old De Niro was as good as a boxer as any professional middleweight working at the time. Also to add authenticity to their relationship, Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, who knew each other but weren't friends in 1979, lived together, and Pesci would work with De Niro and LaMotta during those training sessions. The boxing scenes would amount to less than 10 minutes of screen time once the film was cut together, but it would take a month and a half to film every carefully choreographed setup, close-up, punch, and blood spurt. Some shots were extremely difficult to get, as Scorsese and Chapman wanted to get everything they could on set instead of relying on any kind of special effects after the fact. In one scene, following LaMotta back into his corner after the end of one round and then back into the center of the ring when it was time to start the next, Chapman would need to both change the frame rate running through the camera from 24 frames a second to 48 and adjust the camera's diaphragm to keep the exposure consistent at the same time for the start of the shot, and then reverse both of them when it was time to move back into the action. But they would nail it, creating one of the most perfect shots in cinema history. After they were done in Los Angeles, the production would head back to New York for three more months of shooting, and then that planned break for De Niro to get out of shape before returning for two weeks of filming of the bigger, older LaMotta. Once production was completed, Scorsese, editor Thelma Schumacher, and the sound team spent the remainder of 1979 and the first half of 1980 getting the film into shape. For Schumacher, this would be her big break. She and Scorsese had been friends for years, having first met while they were both students at NYU, and she had edited Scorsese's first feature, 1967's Who's that knocking at my door? But because she was not a member of the Motion Picture Editors Guild, she could not get hired on to any of Scorsese's Hollywood productions. The Editors Guild, like many other guilds in Hollywood at the time, had only male members and continually refused her applications for membership. But suddenly, in 1979, 
she would become one of the first female members of the guild. And to this day, she's still not 100% sure why they all of a sudden had a change of heart. Rumor has it that De Niro, Scorsese, and Al Pacino made personal pleas to the membership board on her behalf, but no one has ever verified that. Unbeknownst to Scorsese, while post-production continued, United Artists was getting cold feet about the movie. They were quietly shopping the uncompleted and unseen film to other distributors, but they would find no takers. Scorsese would finally show his cut of the film to the heads of United Artists in mid-July at the MGM screening room in Midtown Manhattan. I had seen a number of movies at that screening room while I was living in New York City in the early 2000s, and it was one of the best rooms to watch a movie in. If there was to be any discomfort in the room during the two-hour and ten-minute running time, it was not going to be because of the seats. At the end of the screening, Scorsese was against the back wall of the theater, nervously anticipating the reaction. The room was silent. Nobody spoke. Nobody clapped. After a moment, one of the executives got up out of his seat, found Scorsese in the back, and walked over to him. The executive shook Scorsese's hand and simply said, Mr. Scorsese, you are an artist, before leaving the room. When the movie opened on November 14, 1980, my 13th birthday, it opened on four screens, including the Sutton Theater and the RKO Cinerama in Manhattan, and the Regent Theater in the Westwood Village area of Los Angeles. United Artists knew they didn't have to sell the movie too hard to New Yorkers, Scorsese being a hometown hero of sorts, so they would only purchase a single full-page ad for the movie in the New York Times, with no poll quotes listed. But for Los Angeles, where most Academy voters lived, United Artists would splurge on a two-page ad, with the complete review for the film by Los Angeles Times lead film critic Charles Champlin printed on the second page, which had run in the paper the previous Sunday. Well, actually, it's not 100% a review. It starts out as a writer's observational notebook entry, pointing out the curious case of a studio releasing two movies on the same day about the rise and fall of Italian-Americans who experienced the highest highs and the lowest lows. The third paragraph of the article talks a bit about Taylor Hackford's The Idolmaker, the other movie United Artists was releasing that Friday, while the fourth paragraph goes into a bit of detail about what the two films have in common. But the other 14 paragraphs, all Scorsese, all De Niro, all Raging Bull, and very much the epitome of a rave review. Other critics would rave about it too. Jack Kroll of Newsweek would call it the best American movie of the year. Good Morning America's Pat Collins said it was perfect. The Today Show's Gene Shalit called it a masterwork. Inspired, proclaimed Andrew Saris of The Village Voice. And Joel Siegel, who at the time was still the local New York film critic for ABC, said Raging Bull was stunning and incredible. And in those first three days, in those four theaters, the film would gross more than $128,000, more than 17 times the per-screen average of The Idolmaker, which had opened in 171 theaters. After five weeks on just those four screens, Raging Bull had grossed $863,800. When United Artists finally expanded past those four theaters in its sixth week on December 19th, it would expand from four screens to 180 screens. But they may have overestimated how much people wanted to see a gritty but well-made black-and-white film about a boxer who was a real asshole to everyone around him during the Christmas season. While the gross would jump from $72,000 the previous weekend to nearly $650,000, the per-screen average would tumble from 18000 to barely 3600 what did people want to see that Christmas? Films like the Clint Eastwood comedy Any Which Way You Can, the Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Dolly Parton comedy 9 to 5, the Richard Pryor, Gene Wilder comedy Stir Crazy, the Zucker, Abram Zucker comedy Airplane, the Goldie Hawn comedy Private Benjamin, a re-release of the Disney musical animated comedy The Aristocats, the Goldie Hawn Chevy Chase comedy Seems Like Old Times, 
the Robert Altman musical comedy Popeye, even the unintentional comedy of Neil Diamond's The Jazz Singer remake. All of these films that were in release around the same time, in November and December of 1980, would outgross Raging Bull. After five months of scraping by thanks to word of mouth and a number of awards, despite never getting anything close to a wide release, the movie would leave theaters in the summer of 1981 with a little less than $23.35 million in ticket sales. Now, that doesn't sound all that great, but that would adjust to about $69.25 million in December 2019 money, the last proper full year of movie releases before the pandemic. And it would put it ahead of Angel Has Fallen, but below Zombieland Double Tap. In other words, it was a solid double. And those awards? The National Society of Film Critics would give Scorsese their Best Director Award, as well as Joe Pesci for Best Supporting Actor, and Michael Chapman for Best Cinematography, while also giving second place acknowledgments to the movie for Best Picture, behind Melvin and Howard, and to De Niro for Best Actor behind Peter O'Toole in The Stuntman, while Kathy Moriarty would come in third for supporting actress after Mary Steenburgen in Melvin and Howard and Deborah Winger in Urban Cowboy. The National Board of Review would give De Niro their Best Actor Prize and Pesci Best Supporting Actor, and the film would be named the second best film of the year behind Ordinary People. The New York Film Critics Circle would name Raging Bull as a runner-up for Best Picture alongside Melvin and Howard, both behind Ordinary People. Scorsese and Robert Redford would be runners-up for Best Director behind Jonathan Demme for Melvin and Howard, while De Niro and Pesci would win for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor, respectively. Their L.A. counterparts would name the movie as Best Picture of the Year and De Niro as Best Actor but Pesci would be named a runner-up to Timothy Hutton in Ordinary People. And for the Academy Awards, the movie would be nominated in eight categories. Best Picture, Director, Leading Actor, Supporting Actor, Supporting Actress, Cinematography, Film Editing, and Sound. But the film itself would only win two awards. Robert De Niro for Best Actor, his second Oscar in six years and his first in the leading category, and Thelma Schumacher for Best Editing. She would eventually win two more Best Editing Oscars, and she is currently tied with Michael Kahn for the most nominations for Best Editing with eight, and tied with Kahn and two others for the most wins in that category with three. The film's reputation would continue to grow over the years. Roger Ebert would, at the end of 1989, proclaim it to be the best film of the entire decade and one of the ten greatest films of all time. In 1990, the Library of Congress would select it to be a culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant film worthy of being preserved, only ten years after its theatrical release. There have only been three other narrative features to be given the same honor in such a short time frame. Do the Right Thing, Toy Story, and Goodfellas. Most films have to wait 20 or more years before being considered worthy of inclusion on the National Film Registry. Raging Bull would place sixth in a tie with The Bicycle Thieves and Vertigo on the 2002 Sight and Sound poll of the greatest movies of all time, although it would fall to 53rd in 2012. It would also be named to Time Magazine's all-time 100 movies list in 2005. Variety would place it 39th on their 2009 list of the 50 best movies of all time, 75th on the National Society of Film Critics poll of the 100 essential movies, and 6th on the Rolling Stone 100 Maverick Movies in the Last 100 Years poll. The American Film Institute has included Raging Bull on four of their 100 years lists, number 24 on their 1998 100's movie list, number 51 on their 2001 100 Thrills list, number 4 on their updated 2007 list of the 100 movies, and number 1 on their top 10 sports movies of all time. And the Motion Pictures Editor Guild would name it as the best edited film of all time in their 2012 poll of members. 
My own relationship with Raging Bull is complicated. It's probably the best movie that's ever come out on my birthday, November 14th, and it's one of Scorsese's most beautifully crafted film. The cast is note perfect. Scorsese's direction is magical. Michael Chapman's cinematography is like watching real footage from 1943, except better because unlike newsreel footage of the day or the photographs of Arthur Ouija Felig, is that we're actually in the ring with LaMotta and Sugar Ray Robinson or Jimmy Reeves or Tony Gennaro or Marcel Sardin, seeing every punch up close and personal, every bead of sweat pouring off the boxers' bodies, every drop of blood that goes flying. There has never been a boxing movie with such an unflinching look at the barbarism of boxing. And after years of enjoying going to one of my dad's co-workers' house to watch the top fights on pay-per-view, I found myself needing to re-examine my feelings towards the sport. No longer did I see any beauty in Ali's movement. No longer would I care if he could get his title back one more time. Duran and Leonard were going to have a rematch? I didn't care. Mike Tyson, Floyd Mayweather? I've never seen them fight. And this disgust seeped over into other points of views as I've got older. I never got into WWE or WrestleMania like my friends. If I saw Hulk Hogan or Rowdy Roddy Piper in a movie, I wouldn't have the same references or reverence for them the way, say, Tommy, the drummer of my high school band The Flying Pigs would. He worshipped wrestling and wrestlers. When Ultimate Fighting Championship became a thing in the early 90s, I didn't care. It was more barbaric than boxing, and for me, there's enough pain in the world without people needlessly beating the crap out of each other for money and audience bloodlust. As I got older and dreamed of being a filmmaker, I still watched the movie constantly. Well, not watched it, but studied it. Studied the camera angles and the camera movement. Examined the editing. Contemplated how the score made certain scenes more effective. Scrutinized how speeding up or slowing down the camera affected the audience's visceral reaction. But I never did become a filmmaker. I came close a couple times, but that's another story for another time. As I got older, I found it harder and harder to just watch the movie. Not just this movie, though. My tolerance for using my time to watch horrible people be horrible to other people has dramatically decreased over the years. I haven't watched The Shining or even Taxi Driver in a very long time because I no longer connect to them the way I once did. I've never seen a movie like The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover because I'm not interested in graphic violence for the sake of graphic violence. I won't watch movies like Hereditary or Midsommar because I no longer have the desire to be uncomfortably creeped out. I'm 53. I've been married for nearly 20 years, and I want to spend what time I have left on this plane of existence enjoying life, even if it means I may no longer experience a work of art like Raging Bull because I no longer enjoy watching the brutality within. Especially when Scorsese has so many movies like Kundun or Hugo that celebrate the beauty of life, of love, and the magic of cinema. Now, if you want to learn more about the making of Raging Bull, there's a brand new book out about the film called Raging Bull The Making Of, written by Jay Glennie, which was just released a few weeks ago. I have not had the opportunity to read it, but I'm certain I will end up catching it somewhere down the line. I'll have a link up to it on this episode's page at filmjerk.com if you'd like to learn more about it. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again soon. The Film Jerk Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for Idiosyncratic Entertainment. Thank you again. Good night.